This is the Made for Success podcast, and this is Chris Widener, speaker and author of over 15 books, including the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, The Angel Inside. The Made for Success podcast will help you turn your potential into performance, succeed in every area of your life, and achieve your dreams. And now, enjoy the show. Our guest today is Don Hudson. Don Hudson's careers in speaking, management, and sales have brought him many honors. He successfully worked his way through the University of Memphis, graduating with a degree in sales. After becoming the number one salesperson in a national training organization, he established his own training firm and shortly thereafter was in demand as a professional speaker. Since then, Don has addressed over two-thirds of the Fortune 500 companies and is featured in over 100 training films. He is chairman and CEO of U.S. Learning and makes some 85 speaking appearances per year. Perhaps you've seen him on national television where he is regularly featured on PBS. Our speaker is the author of seven books, including The Sale and The Contented Achiever, and is a member of the prestigious Speakers Roundtable. Don was elected by his peers to the presidency of National Speakers Association, and he has received its Cavett Award as Member of the Year. He is also in NSA's Speaker Hall of Fame. Other merits include the founding board of the Society of Entrepreneurs, the 1999 Consummate Speaker of the Year Award, and a St. Jude Children's Hospital Humanitarian Award recipient. Please welcome Don Hudson. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, good to have you here. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, fun to finally meet you. We've uh, talked over the years, a couple of years, and gotten to know each other that way, and finally good to yeah. get a chance to meet each other. Yeah, well, I have great admiration with what you're doing with this great telecast. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I have a question for you. How do you explain or define the word outstanding? Because I know that one of the things you go in and you teach people how to do is how to be outstanding. What makes an outstanding person? Well, I think Murphy's Law probably applies. In most sales organizations, 20% of the salespeople are making 80% of the sales. So, big question is, how do you get in the 20%, which is your reference to outstanding. Right. Uh, I, I do a segment of material, which we'll be doing on a show later mm -hmm. for you, uh, that deals with the attributes of the high-performance salespeople. I think the best salespeople are the men and the women who are doing a lot of different things extremely well. Mm -hmm. And they're all important, and they're always working on, they're tweaking, that's an old aviation term, mm -hmm. always fine-tuning every part of their sales process. As they get involved in that fine-tuning, everything they're doing gets a little bit better, a little bit better over time. And one perspective I like to put it in is this. It just seems that there's some salespeople, like that 20% I refer to, that seem to have an innate ability to compress more achievement into a given measurable time frame than other people. Why would that be? I think it's because of all those little bitty, very important, nitty gritty things that they've been fine tuning and tweaking through the years and making every one of them work a little bit better. They're a little bit more disciplined about the principle of start early and stay late. They take somewhat shorter coffee breaks if they take them at all, somewhat shorter luncheon breaks. They're compressing more achievement into a given measurable time frame. They are very uh, judicious about managing their time and their efforts. And they're making things happen by compressing that achievement into a time frame. And they're doing it with more diligence and more passion than the other 80%. Mm -hmm. The other 80% might have as, as high or higher an IQ. They might work almost as many hours, but the intensity's not there. Mm -hmm. So my role when a company hires me, if I'm just doing like a 90-minute speech to wrap up their sales meeting, I'm going to create some energy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have them thinking, and I'm going to develop a content-rich, tailored presentation, but I want energy. Mm -hmm. I want those people feeling the passion. I want them to say, you know what? I'm going to do something about what I just heard. I'm going to actually change some behaviors. Mm -hmm. So do speakers and trainers change lives? I mean, they're watching your TV station right now. Are some lives going to be changed? The answer is you betcha. Now, it sounds kind of trite for a speaker to say, well, I'm in the business of changing lives. I don't say that. Yeah. But if I'm worth my salt, I'm going to be getting people to change some behaviors. And if you get them to change their behaviors, they're going to nurture new and better habits. And you know what? It's going to change their life. Yeah, you're at least going to put them in a position where they're going to have the decision about whether or not they're going to That's let their life That's correct. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. So somebody's watching us today and they say, I want to, you know what? I want to be a, a better salesperson. I want to make more money. I know I've got uh, more upside. I know I can achieve more. What are the core competencies? that that person can say, okay, these are the things I need to improve to become a better salesperson. What's the core competencies of exceptional salespeople? All right, I think, uh, let's, let's break it down this way. What they know, 
the knowledge they've got. Product the skill, knowledge? Product knowledge and sales <clears throat> knowledge. Okay. So we're going to call that the skill side. Okay. And the other side is, is the effort factor, the energy, the motivation, the passion, the fire in the belly. We've heard all those terms. Yeah. Both of those are critically important. And the great salespeople today have a strong and significant mix of those two that both work really, really well for them. Yeah. It's almost like it, it creates a, a synergy. It's almost like two plus two equals seven. When you get the two together, the, the content-rich approach, the heavy skills, I know about selling, I've got my product knowledge down cold, and, man, I am energized about taking it into the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Now, either one of those without the other, party's over. They're back in the 80%. Mm-hmm. May or may not even make the cut at year's end mm-hmm. to keep their job. It's about being in the 20%. So the skill level, which will break down into product knowledge and sales knowledge, as mentioned, both critical, and then the effort factor. Work ethic, call count, uh, our ability to be resilient when we get rejected. Hey, nobody sells everybody. Everybody gets some no's. And my big question to a salesperson is, how do you deal with it? Yeah. Do you tuck your tail and run? Do you sometimes take rejection personally? You're on the way out if that's the case. Don't take it personally. Go out there and make another sales call, not later. Make it right now and be as good as you've ever been before on this next call. That's resilience. That's all part of that effort factor. Why do you think, why do you think that gets so many people? They can't stand rejection. They can't stand being told no. When somebody tells them no, they quit. They, I don't, I'm not cut out for sales. Why is it, you know, most people quit in that area, and what is it that causes some people to say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead anyway? Being resilient and handling rejection is a skill. It's a skill which must be learned, it must be mastered, it must be internalized. Now, if somebody wants to get real emotional about it and they say, oh, I'm I'm just not cut out for this, I mean, they're letting their emotion Hmm. guide their ship. Not a good thing in a case like that. No. We've got to be determined about our own direction. And that comes with that inner discipline and this resilience, this bounce back factor. My first sales manager in, in sales training was Dick Gardner. He used to have a term he called stick to mm-hmm. Probably not even in the dictionary, but it was, it's a cool word. Yeah. And he used to say, he called me Hut. He said, Hut, how bad do you want to make it in this business? I said, I'm going to make it in this business if you'll help me. He said, I'll help you. He said, are you willing to do exactly what I tell you? I said, man, I'm on. I'll do exactly what you tell me. I'm 21 years old. I'm wet behind the ears, but I'm eager, right? My uh, energy level was pretty high. My skill factor wasn't very great at that point, but I was willing to learn. He said, okay, if you make 35 in-person sales calls every day, you'll talk to 17 people. You talk to 17 people, you're going to make five sales. He said, you willing to make 35 calls a day? I said, I'm going to do anything you tell me. He said, great, 30, I want 35 sales calls tomorrow. Now, that's a lot of sales calls. Now, you don't get to talk to everybody, but you're really knocking on a lot of business doors. Man, I was working hard, and I wasn't doing very well early on. But with his direction, I got it going. But you know what? He was right. Mm-hmm. It's a numbers game. Mm-hmm. You make 35 calls, you talk to 17 people, you make five sales cool. Now, were those exact numbers every day? No, but over a two-week span, you run the numbers, it works out almost exactly like that. So do you think we look at successful people and say, oh, I bet they never get rejected, and then that's why we can't handle it when it happens to us ourselves? I think it's part of a shallow illusion that a lot of salespeople make sometimes and possess, Chris, because it, it's back to that emotion of selling's not for me. Yeah. Hey, selling can be for anybody who wants to learn the skill. I don't think there are any born salespeople. Mm-hmm. We're not born to be great. We're, we're trained to be great. Now, on that issue that, that you brought up dealing with greatness in selling, we've got to earn the right to be successful. Mm-hmm. Now, to gain commitments, everybody's going to have a closure rate, and nobody sells everybody. Mm-hmm. Nobody sells everybody. So we're going to have some rejection in there. And I tell people in my programs, you got to go through the no's to earn the right to experience the yeses. And if you don't go through the no's, you can forget the yeses. You're not going to earn the right to experience them. People say, hmm, okay, how many no's I got to go through? I don't know. Depends on what your numbers are. Yeah. Are you keeping up with your numbers? 
and any salesperson who's not is going to be leaving a lot of productivity on the table. And it doesn't it fluctuate based on what you're selling and the price of what you're selling? It's going to fluctuate by salesperson. Sure. But the important thing is for that salesperson individually to master his own numbers, whether he compares them to anybody else in the company or not. Yeah. I mean, our biggest competitor is our uh, that person in the mirror, yeah. uh, the, the, the complacency of not making a call. I mean, that's our enemy. Mm -hmm. Our greatest friend is our, our energy to get out there and be passionate about what we're doing. Do you think there's natural-born salespeople? And, and if there is, what about the rest of us? <laughs> you know, I would have said... 25 years ago, I probably would have answered in the affirmative. Hmm. I really don't think so today. Hmm. I don't think we're born to be great in selling. I think we're trained to be great. Now, some people have more of a natural extroverted personality, which lends itself to, uh, to good interaction many times. But again, a lot of people who don't have that are still great salespeople today. Mm -hmm. Like a person who's very analytical in their approach to communicating might be a great salesperson because they are many times the best information gatherers. They take the best notes. They keep the best records. They ask really well thought out questions. Hmm. Kind of different out there today. Yeah. It seems like things have changed. Uh, the way people that want to be uh, sold has changed. The way the, the tolerance level of what we have for what other people will, uh, how they will interact with us has changed and yep. that type of thing. Same is true, I think, in leadership. And so I want to kind of switch now to another one of the topics that you spend a lot of time working with your corporate clients on, and that is 21st century leadership. What is the, the core principles behind 21st century leadership? Well, I think it's being the kind of leader or manager that people are eager to follow. Hmm. There are some people who have a leadership title, but if at any given moment they were to take a quick look behind them, there wouldn't be anybody back there hmm. following. Hmm. And that person has adopted a leadership style, which is really not working very well. Now, if they got a real big ego, they might not even know it. They think, hey, I've got position power. I'm the boss, they better do what I tell them to do. But that kind of a leadership style is really kind of old school thinking. I think the best leaders today, Chris, are the men and the women who get out there and they talk to their people and they find out what their people think. They give them opportunities for authorship. Uh, the greatest leaders, in my opinion, are the leaders who believe in the principle that all of us is smarter than one of us. Mm. And that's a great team approach. And I think we've got to have a leadership style that is compelling to the people who report to us. So I want to talk to you about leadership style because uh, leadership is one of the things that I talk primarily about. And, and so I find it fascinating and, and particularly this, this transition that has taken place over the years mm -hmm. where 75 years ago, I think the leadership style was a benevolent dictator. The dictator, benevolent dictator. You know, I'm the boss, you're the worker, and that's the way the boss thought about it, and quite frankly, it's the way the employee thought about it. Yeah. I get paid a check, and if so you go much little, different now. <laughs> if you go back a little further than that, there wasn't even much benevolence in the right, dictatorship. It was just dictator. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the old Theory X leadership style, which was hardline, autocratic, uh, manage and lead with an iron hand and a steel fist, mm -hmm. that basically peaked at, at the, about the turn of not this century, but the last century. Mm -hmm. So anybody who manages like that today, I think is a good century behind. Mm -hmm. So what changed? Did the leaders change or did the people change? Because Everything now, changed. Okay. Our society changed. Uh, success principles in business changed. Respect for dignity and individuality changed. Mm -hmm. uh, everything changed. And now we're in a sophisticated society today where leaders have got to have a compelling style. They've got to look back and see a bunch of enthusiastic people back there saying, I will do anything you tell me to do. Mm. And for a leader to have that kind of a style, they've got to do it right. Yeah. Now, what does right look like? i got some opinions on that. We'll talk about it. Let's take a 20-second break to thank our sponsor, Made for Success Publishing. For listeners of this show, visit madeforsuccess.com forward slash podcast and enjoy half off of the world's most popular personal development audiobooks. Use coupon code SUCCESS at checkout for a 50% savings. Now, back to the Made for Success podcast show. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, leading different generations. Greatest generation, most of them are out of the workforce at this point. Some of them are still leading. Uh, baby boomers, they're the primary leaders uh, currently uh, and a, a big part of the workforce. Generation X, obviously, next, and then Generation Y, which is just coming into the workforce. Every single one of those generations views leadership and followership 
differently. They do, and their values are different. Yeah. I think it's incumbent upon the leader to find out what those differences are and to be able to deal with that maturely and successfully. Mm. In, in every one of those constituencies you just named, a leader's got to do his homework. Generally speaking, if there are a couple of principles that might apply pretty much to all of them, one is respect for the worker, okay. respect for the team member, and one is uh, giving them opportunities for authorship. I don't even know if that word's in the dictionary either. I think I might have created that one, but mm. here's the way it works. Okay. Let's say I'm thinking about uh, changing a company policy. I'm the boss and you're, uh, you're in the rank and file. And I say, uh, Chris, I need to get your opinion on something. Would you, would you be willing to share your thoughts with me? And you respond to that. People love to be asked their opinion, yeah. right? You said, you know, we need to change this policy about tardiness in the company. And I'd like to get your uh, input. And I'm going to ask a few other people. And, and now all of a sudden I'm putting an idea on the table that we need to tweak this in our policies and procedures manual as to how we deal with tardiness. But I'm asking you your opinion, and I get the opinions of some other people. I'm giving you an opportunity to help author the new and finely tuned item in the policies and procedures manual. What if, well, you, you, don't, what if you don't like that, though? What if you're the leader or the owner of a company? And, I mean, this is this balance, I think, between that benevolent dictator, which says, hey, I own the company, and, I, you know, and I, I'm going in a direction, and this other side that says, I really believe that there's value in each individual and that we all participate together. But what's the balance between setting the direction and going with consensus leadership? That balance is the word. You've got to find the okay. balance. You might give me an answer I don't like too much. What if I say I'm all for tardiness? In fact, I think we ought to, we ought to come in uh, at 9.30 instead of 9. And you just go, okay. we're not going to well, be able to do it. All right. In this particular case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assert myself in a pleasant sort of manner. Okay. See, I think great leaders do not demand. They persuade. Right. I'm going to say, Chris, that would never work around here, and here's why. And then I will persuade you as best I possibly can, mm -hmm. to believe in the principle, we got to get started at 9 o'clock. So you're trying to help them through your persuasion and your relationship to come to an understanding that they need yeah. to change their position. It's about communications, and it's about respect, mm -hmm. personal respect. In 75 to 100 years ago, the boss didn't respect the workers very much. He said, I'm the boss. I'm the one has got to make payroll. We're going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't fly anymore. People there are going to say, well, great, do it your way without me, mm -hmm. and they're gone. Yeah. So we've got to have a compelling leadership style that people respond to. So let's say I give several people the opportunity to help me author the new policy on tardiness. Okay. So I get your input. I get the input of several other people. And then I might get a little more input from somebody on actually drafting the exact wording. And, and you know, I'm the boss. I mean, the buck stops with me. So yeah. I'm going to come up with what it says with everybody's input. But now there's just one word in that two-sentence policy that was your word. And you like that. You're buying in. Mm -hmm. And everybody else sees a little bit of their own influence in that well-thought-out short paragraph about this policy in the company. And as they see that, they not only buy in, they feel some personal ownership. Hmm. That's how you build this very strong web of, of integral belief and trust with your workers in the company. Hmm. And it's the reason great leaders are great. The greatest leaders are people that people will follow them anywhere. Yeah, exactly. They're that good. Huh. But it's about respect. It's about communications. I teach a simple principle about communications that goes like this. It's okay to over-communicate. It's just not okay to under-communicate. Huh. Because when you under-communicate, you don't communicate. There's misunderstanding there. It just doesn't get done. If you over-communicate, that's okay. You got a little overlap. Cool. And, and what percentage of people? What percentage of people Most actually people, over uh, over communicate? Very few. Most very people under communicate. Right. And that's. I mean, the wars have been waged, marriages have been destroyed, and companies have gone down the tubes. And I mean, all kinds of terrible things have happened due to miscommunications and under communication. Yeah, when was the last time your wife said to you, you know, we just talk too much? <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? Under communication. Actually, my wife you. is also a professional speaker and we do talk oh, you a do lot. Talk too much. <laughs> so talk to me about managers. Uh, is, there, is there a difference between a leader and a manager? I hear this all the time. You know, leaders aren't managers, managers aren't leaders, but then I think, well, don't leaders have to manage and managers have to lead? You know what? I, I think it's, there's some different skill sets involved, but I think the greats are good at both. Hmm. Management is more task oriented and leadership is more people oriented. Okay. That's I mean that's the simplest distinction I can think of, but they're both very important. Okay. Let's talk about something that's key to both selling and leadership, and that's motivation. Okay. And you do a, one of my a, favorite topics. Yeah, you do a series of trainings uh, called Motivation to the Max. How do you get 
and stay motivated. Okay. Well, first, the definition. Yeah. Uh, Thoreau has the best definition of motivation I've ever heard. He says, motivation is the pull of anticipation hmm. and the push of discipline. The pull of? The pull of anticipation, anticipation. and the push of discipline. Huh. Excellent. Great definition. Yeah. You see, anticipation, we can do a half day on these two words, anticipation yeah. and discipline. But anticipation, that, those are the goals we set, the visions we establish, and, and the objectives we've got for the coming year, things of that nature. And we got to get all that in place. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that I talk so, so energetically about the importance of goal setting. Most people don't do a very good job of goal setting if they do any at all. Why? What, what, uh, what do they do well, wrong? Well, in great, rich, beautiful America, we don't even have to. Huh. We're so prosperous, we can just go out and schmooze around and make a decent living. Yeah. It's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. And for people who are really, really good, who become really, really wealthy and become a, the envy of people all around the world, hey, only in America, right? Whose job is it to, to make sure motivation happens? Is it the leader or is it the person who shows up at work every day? Good question. The answer is yes. I think it's incumbent upon the leader to make sure that, that there's an environment conducive to, to self-motivation. I think it's incumbent upon the worker to make sure they're doing what they need to do to be their best. We talk about the anticipation and the discipline. The anticipation is the, the vision, the goals, the objectives we talked about. The discipline, that's where we get back into the, uh, the, the concept of being energized yeah. and and being personally motivated and being uh, willing to pay the price and to put forth a great work ethic and that type of thing. One of the things that I use in a, uh, a program that ties right into that thought line, Chris, deals with the idea that everybody has two self-images. We have a present self-image and a projected self-image. So I might see somebody who'll come up to talk to me at the end of a talk. And I realize I'm talking to somebody who's got a pretty good present self-image. Now, that's defined as a snapshot at this moment of your strengths and weaknesses based on self-perception. Hmm. That's your present self-image. I continue to talk to him, and I realize, wow, this person's got a pretty significant projected self-image. One year, two years, five years out. Projected implies going into the future. Mm -hmm. So the people who enjoy the greatest factor of personal motivation, in my opinion, are the people who have a good present self-image, but they got a projected self-image that's up here somewhere. Mm. And that deviation between where they are and where they genuinely plan to be is their source of fire in the belly. That's where the passion comes from. That's the reason goal setting is so important in the establishment of one's personal visions. If we don't do it, we're what Zig used to call a wandering generality instead of a meaningful specific. Mm. And that's the reason goals must have detail. They've got to be in writing. Less than one half of 1% of the American workforce writes down their goals. Mm. That's terrible. What's the power in writing it down? You program your subconscious by writing it down. Okay. That's, where, that's the goal achievement mechanism of the human being. So you put your subconscious mind to work simply Absolutely. by writing it down. Yeah. I ask people, do you, would you like to have a, uh, a uh, seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day servant working for you, no charge? Everybody says, they laugh, say, yeah, 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 yeah it'd be great. I say, great, you got one. All you got to do is put them to work. It's your subconscious mind. Hmm. Now, this servant won't wash your car for you, but this servant is going to take you where you want to go. It'll enable you to buy a new clean car. Hmm. That's the power of the subconscious mind. But it's only good if it's programmed. And the best way to program it is with hard data. Jim Rohn says, if something's important, work from document, not just thought. That's one of my favorite lines of Jim's. Hmm. Write it down. Go to document. Hey, when's the last time you bought a house, Chris? One year and two months ago. All right, when you left that closing, how thick were the documents? <laughs> I was just worried about my mortgage at that yeah, point. Right. <laughs> but I'll no, bet you no, left it was with a ton of, ton of, ton of paperwork. Lots of paper. Ton of paperwork. And yeah. the more important something is, the more documentation there is sure. to it. If something's important, you work from document. Hmm. And something as important as one's career, their financial well-being, the balance and peace of mind in their life, what's more important than these things? Yeah. Write down the goals. Okay, so here's something for you, particularly in the workplace. Um, the obvious motivator is, I mean, the simplest form is the paycheck. You know, you, you come, you work 40 hours, we pay X amount of dollars. Uh, then you move it more into, that's more of a transaction. Then you move it into a motivator, which is if you do really well, then we'll give you more money, a bonus or extra commission, whatever. In, in corporate America or, or business America, how do you motivate people aside from the paycheck? 
what are the other ways you motivate people? Well, I think it goes back to getting to know people really well and finding out what they want. And somebody asked me one time, how many people can a sales manager manage? Like, we got sales manager, we've got like 23 people for every sales manager. Is that too many? And of course, that's way too many. Now, if you're going to manage in mass and give them a few guidelines, sure, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a genuinely skilled manager and leader to your people, maybe six or eight, ten max, because mm -hmm. you've got to take the time to get inside the heads of every one of them. Mm -hmm. And when you get inside their heads, you're going to find out a lot of things about their values. You're going to find out who they are and what they want. You're going to find out what kind of price they're willing to pay. You're going to really start to understand the human dynamics of that individual. And you're going to find out that you're talking to Joe over here who is not particularly money motivated. But Megan over here, she loves the buck. Yeah. She'll really work harder to get that extra bonus. Yeah. You don't manage those people exactly the same way. How do you? Okay, so that one's easy. The, the money motivator. Okay, great. You tell her you hit this sales number, you get X amount of dollars extra, and she says terrific, and she off she goes. This guy though, not money motivated. He loves the paycheck that he gets. It allows him to provide for his family, but in in terms of extracting from him his maximum potential, how do you as a leader motivate him? I think a great leader is a consultant to every person they lead. I'm going to get inside their head and I'm going to find out what makes them tick. And I'm going to manage and lead and motivate that person with a specific, individually developed strategy. What are some of the things that motivate people inside the workplace that, that leaders can begin with? You know, the, people are watching, they're going, okay, great, sounds great. But what are some of the things I could at least start with? Okay, so maybe there's somebody, their big passion is they're family-oriented. Okay. Okay. So... Um, they're I'm, always talking about their kids, teaching yeah, them to lead. Very, very family-oriented. Okay. So I'm going to take that into consideration when I'm talking to that individual about what's going on and what they need to be doing and what their objectives need to be. I'm going to get more explicit about what their goals are. Tell me about your family goals. And I'm going to be a resource to them to help them reach their goals based on what their high level of needs might be. Mm -hmm. And that takes some time and some energy and some forethought. And it's different with different people. So you might say, uh, look, if you look... I love that you love your family. That's terrific. I want to be a support to that. Uh, if you hit your numbers or if you do a good job, uh, do a good job, we're going to give you more time off to coach that little league team or it go on those Boy Scout trips. It could be something like that. Something yeah. that practical. Yeah. But that takes effort because you got to get to know the person. That's right. Yeah. And the most successful leaders invest the time and energy to do that. Okay. Talk about Contented Achiever, which is one of your books. I co-authored that book with George Lucas and Chris Crouch, and it's a cool book, and it deals with the idea that ultimately in life, most of us want achievement and contentment. Mm -hmm. So we created this, this model, and one is the achievement model where we've got high achievers, successful people on one end, and we've got low achievers or unsuccessful people on the other end of this continuum. That's the, the horizontal axis. Success, failure. Mm -hmm. Then we've got a vertical axis called fulfillment. And the people at the top are fulfilled. And they feel good about life and so forth. And the people down at the very bottom are very frustrated. Things are not working in their life. So people who are frustrated on the bottom, but on the right, they're still achieving some things. We call them the soap opera people. Mm -hmm. They're in that quadrant of people who they've got some material possessions. Like, you know, soap operas, you see the beautiful people, right? Yeah. Handsome men and beautiful women driving big, beautiful cars and going to beautiful places. And that is the single most miserable bunch of people on the planet. Which is why in soap operas they go from wife to wife to wife to wife. Yeah, that's all, husband that's husband. all awful yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 So that's what we call the soap opera people. And we suggest that's really not the best place to be. Sure. Then we move around the grid. We go over here. We've got the people who, if, if high achievement is over here and low achievement is over here, these people in the eyes of a lot of people are failing. And they're also very, very frustrated. We call them the tar pit people down there in that quadrant. Mm. They're just stuck. Just stuck. They just can't do anything right. Mm. You've heard about Murphy's Law. These people are living Murphy's life. Uh, Nothing's working. Uh, and they better change some behaviors and change them fast to try to get out of the tar pit. Uh, and we've probably all done a little bit of tar pit time in our lives. The key is if you're standing in a hole, quit digging. Change some behaviors. Refocus. Get out of that tar pit. Then we go up on the grid and we've got the, the people over here who we say are, are failing by most people's standards, but they're fulfilled. 
Are there many people like that? Not too many, okay. but we call them the oxymoron the small, people. Small segment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The oxymoron people. The you know, best example of the stereotypical uh, uh, case would probably be the hippies of years ago. Hey, they're not achieving anything. Yeah. Yeah, they're out there probably smoking dope and wasting time and not working, but boy, they're happy. <laughs> the oxymoron yeah. people. And they, their longevity is not going to be great under those conditions. Right. Again, behavior changes in order. Then we got the people who are high achievement and very fulfilled. That's the upper right-hand quadrant. We call them the contented achievers. Hmm. Their goals are in place. They've got a good achievement plan. Their life is in balance. They've got all the, the various aspects of goal setting, of spiritual, financial, family, social, physical, community. All of these different things are, are in balance and in harmony, and they are highly contented, and they are successful in the eyes of most people. So the, the book, The Contented Achiever, talks about how to get up here and stay up here and avoid the other three quadrants that we fall into when we get out of focus. Is contentment an emotional state? Good question. I, I would guess largely it is, and I think uh, contentment for some people is based on some things, and other people it's based on other things. Mm -hmm. It's a sense of peace, yeah. sense of feeling uh, well-being. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably somewhat different with different people. Sure. It uh, depends on what your overall life goals and yeah. things like that are. Thanks for listening to the Made for Success podcast. Get to know us at madeforsuccess.com forward slash podcast. Meet the hosts of the Made for Success podcast and pick up a free copy of the Totally Motivated ebook by Chris Widener. We will see you next time on the Made for Success podcast.